It's a black mirror. Um, as Greg said, started off in 2011. Back then it was on Channel 4. Now it's on Netflix. What's going to change as the new season comes around? Any hints? Uh, you mean as the next season comes yeah. around? Oh, I can't really say much about the next season. Um, what can you say? We are, we, uh, well, the prob because we, we like to keep it always a surprise, what we're doing. So um, the number one way to completely fuck that up would be to tell you <laughs> Go on. what's in it. Um, so for that reason, I can, I, we, we can say that it's, uh, experimenting it, ex yeah, with, a little, with a little bit of storytelling yeah. we are. Um, mm. uh, new genres we're taking on. Um, mm. I mean, I think with the anthology, as Charlie was saying, one of the key things is that the joy of doing an anthology is that you don't know what you're going to get. So that's why we, there's no sort of big artistic... Um, uh, Intent at all no, in the whole no, thing. No, no, it's just to, to just make sure you have that surprise when you turn on an episode and you're not sure what you're going to get. So no spoilers. It focuses a lot on fear, though, as a show, um, and some episodes are truly, truly terrifying. What actually scares you both about technology, or in general? Like, what gets you kind of sitting up on the sofa sweating when you're watching TV? Uh, pub quizzes. Okay. <laughs> Fair? Yeah. We haven't done, we haven't done a, we're not oh. doing a pub quiz episode, no. I can tell you that. That's not the experimental thing. Um, so if I drop in some trivia now, though. <laughs> not general knowledge, no. Um, um, I would say, you see, because I, uh, I tend to, one thing, one, one thing that people sometimes say about the show that slightly annoys me is when they, when, when people think it, that the show is inherently anti-technology. Yeah. Or that it is, um, warning people of the dangers of technology, which I don't really think it is. I think it's partly, A, um, I'm neurotic and worry about everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I could worry about germs on a glass as much as I would worry about social media, probably. Have you, um, have you seen how high the stage is? I know. Yes, I thought about I, that. I thought of you when we walked up and I was not going to like this. Genuinely, when I come into somewhere like this, I always have to check where the exits are, and I try to work out if how many people could physically attack me. A lot. And kill me, <laughs> um, and how quickly they would do it with their bare hands, um, uh, which would be, I think, surprisingly quick. Um, uh, but but so so I, I worry about a lot of things. But also because we wanted to do kind of um, what if uh, stories, um, when shows like The Twilight Zone would would uh, would do those, they they'd use a supernatural twist. And now I think we're at a period of history where we're accustomed to things that seem magical. Yeah. Um, and, and inexplicable that have rational explanations for them. They're a piece of technology. So actually, it sort of makes our job as storytellers um, kind of easy or easier. Yeah. Um, but still, when you started out, some of the plots in Black Mirror mm -hmm. seemed a little outlandish, a little yeah. bit um, fantastical. And since then, the real world's kind of caught up with you mm. in terms of pig-based romance in, <laughs> in very literal terms. Yeah. But you've got things like Trump, you've got Brexit. Mm. There's video footage coming out of China of people being rated on this social credit system for bad behavior on trains. Yes. Um, and play, cheating sue. at video games. We you should, know, this kind we of should sue. sue for that. Yeah. Actually, they've they've um, pretty much stolen China. an episode of, of okay. Black Mirror, right? The thing, I think, suppose the things that do worry me, probably, rather than scare me. There is, you're right, there's a lot of fear in the show are things like when there's, a, when there's a small tweak to something and it has an un unintended consequence. So, for mm. instance, when Twitter changed its format so you would see all the replies dangling off every tweet, yep. like the line of shit that hangs off a goldfish's arse, mm. basically, and it just immediately turned the whole of Twitter into a newspaper comment section. Yep. Like, immediately changed the tone of it, and I think that's what did it. Um, and similarly with YouTube, now my kids are six and four and could not give a shit about television and just want to watch yeah. things on YouTube. And I don't particularly mind that. I don't mind them watching like live streams of Minecraft or whatever. Um, but the way the algorithm then coughs up the next video and the next video and the next video, if you walk out the room as an irresponsible parent, you come back in and they're watching uh, somebody hammering a nail into Peppa Pig's eye or mm. something, or, or somebody ranting, um, you know, d d delivering some kind of extreme political rant. That worries me. Yeah. So do you think that, at times, the, the people that run these major technology companies have quite a utopian vision of how that technology will be used? So you have something like Facebook Live, which they saw as a great way of people broadcasting to the world, and within weeks, people were using it to broadcast murders. Mm. 
Well, how fucking stupid are they to not have <laughs> immediately realised that that was likely? But is that where both of your minds go when you see a, a new technology <laughs> <laughs> when, when with each other, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yes, because aren't you, whenever you're inventing anything, aren't you going to say, right, what could people do with this? I mean, it's sort of basic. Maybe, maybe it's just us, I don't know. But you would sort of go, how could people misuse this? That would be my first... Yeah. yeah, instinct. Because then I'd be to blame. Like, that's what I think. I th yes. It does surprise I mean, genuinely, I think they should employ warriors to... Because didn't, didn't, yeah. didn't the government, didn't the US government do that after 9-11? I read that they, they got a bunch of Hollywood screenwriters in a room and asked them to think up terrorist plots mm. because they were worried that this, they hadn't seen this outlandish terrorist, terrorist plot coming. Like, surely all the companies should just employ very neurotic and worried people and put something in front of them and go, what, what could go wrong with that? Because there's an endless list. But is that, is that quite a useful creative tool when you're coming up with oh, yeah. new episodes and new ideas and new concepts? To look at something that is seen as a utopian vision of a wonderful new future in Silicon Valley and go, what if it all went completely to shit? <laughs> you say, what if it all went completely to shit? <laughs> We have done episodes that aren't dystopian. We have mm. done upbeat, sometimes bittersweet episodes that, that embrace and, and, you know, I don't know, uh, find the good side of technology. One of, some of our most notable, yep. most acclaimed episodes have that. Mm -hmm. You know, San Junipero, which we did in, in um, season three. Yep. Mm. You know, the use of VR and putting VR together with old people and making them, you know, live another life where prejudices didn't exist that they had in their youth. I mean, that's incredibly po positive and optimistic. And that was season three, and then in season four, you had Hang the DJ, which was, again, a more yeah. optimistic, quite yeah. similar sort of story of hope, even though told through um, the yeah. despair of technology. Mm -hmm. So what changed? Because the first two seasons were, not to, to suppose, but they were quite unrelentingly bleak. And then <laughs> there were oh. moments of, as you say, bittersweet, and just sweetness and hope and love and something mm -hmm. different. Well, in season two, we had Be Right Back, which was a beautiful love story about grief and, and the process of mourning in a digital age. And, but that but it was, even in the way it was shot, it was quite bleak. Mm. Um, it, was, it was something yeah. sad. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it was definitely, it was definitely it was sad, sad. But it was, it was beautiful. It was, also, mm. it was a love story. Yeah. And oh, it, wasn't yeah, no, it, was. despair. it wasn't dystopian despair. That's true. Yeah. Quite um, a bleak ending. Uh, a lot of screaming. Hmm, she mm. doesn't end up... No. Anyway, um, <laughs> but 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 you need you know in an anthology you can't you have to uh, be unpredictable and you have to sort of, you can't constantly have bleak endings otherwise it will become very predictable mm. and boring for people and us. Yeah. San Junipero was in fact was was the first script that was completed for uh, after we made the jump to Netflix. Mm -hmm. So that was the first one I did and that was twofold. Partly one it was. I'd read some people going, oh, it's going to be all American now. It's, mm. I like it being all British. So I thought, okay, fuck you, uh, <laughs> California. Um, and, um, and also, um, I did, it was, there was a deliberate attempt to slightly reset what the show was in some respect. Because mm -hmm. if I, I, I realised that if I was picturing what a Black Mirror episode was, it was sort of somebody frowning at a semi-translucent phone. Um, in, in some sort of technological hell. It's a bit like the Apple Store run amok. So, um, so it was a deliberate attempt to present a, a, a utopian um, vision. Mm. I just said vision, and I said it like a prick. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for agreeing with me. So what, what changed? Was it the, the world around Black Mirror got a lot more unrelentingly bleak and dystopian, so you felt that you were getting a bit one note and you needed to mix it up? Was it going to Netflix and having a more international audience? What, no, I think what it went was, on? I think it was genuinely because we were doing six, yeah. rather than when, when, when we'd done the previous seasons, we'd done three mm -hmm. in each one, then we did the Christmas one. And they had, you're right, they had basically all been downer endings, yeah. I guess. Um, and so it was like, well, we could just keep doing this, this that but then becomes predictable. So it was, it was, apart from anything else, it keeps it more interesting for us. If we can constantly change what the tone of the show is, it yeah. means we're doing something hopefully different each time. So it sort of makes our jobs more pleasant. And one of the biggest changes when you went to Netflix, and again, talking about San Junipero, um, when you were with Channel 4, there's obviously a very set order in which those episodes appear. You have complete control over what episode people see first, second, and third, and then fourth, fifth, and sixth, if mm -hmm. you were to do six. So on Netflix, well, you, you, you choose which order they go in between the two of you, yeah? Um, we do. It's quite interesting because they, 
I mean, there was a bit, there was a lot of debate over season three as to what order they were going to go in. Because mm. originally, I think I was like, well, San Junipero has to be the first one. Um, and and uh, Netflix's view was that Nosedive was a, probably a better introduction okay. to the mm. show. And I was quite worried that Nosedive, I felt, was a lighter story. If no one's seen that, it's the one where everyone is ranked out of five. Yeah. Um, and... And they went, no, I think you'll find it's quite nightmarish. And I showed it to a friend of mine who, within 10 minutes, was going, this is a fucking nightmare. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, I've sort of lost sight of that uh, somewhere along the way. And they were right. So it, and, it, and it meant that we had an interesting shape to the season uh, so that San Junipero came along at just the right time after you'd mm. been sort of beaten down with despair. Now, subsequent to that, now people are more aware of what the show is and so they know that they can watch episodes in any order and I think yep. that's so that the viewing habit has slightly changed from season four onwards where people know they can jump to an episode that their friends have mm. recommended. Does it bug you that you don't get control over what people see first? Well, you do. There's still a playlist that you mm. still have yeah. to decide the but they order. Could, and they I think break most it. people probably do watch it in mm. order because they think there's a, it's, be, it's curated, it's, there's an order for a reason. Yeah. So, but your question about Netflix and cha yeah. changes about the show from time to time. Um, I mean, when, with us becoming an international show, I, Charlotte's right, there is that sort of concern, that danger that you're going to go, right, let's make a show for the, the world. And you sort of go, well, how can you possibly do that? But one of, the, one of the things I suppose it has done, because there's bigger budgets, so suddenly you can be sort of slightly more ambitious in, with your films. Um, and so we have set some films abroad in America or Iceland. To, and, and that's also connected to there being a longer run of six. You want there to be a different vision or a different style or just a different backdrop across the six to give them different tones and different moods. Mm -hmm. So that's one advantage, I would say. And also the Netflix advantage of suddenly, you know, you can, um, you can let the story dictate the length of the film. Mm. So in the last season, we did Metalhead with lovely Maxine Peake, which was... 40? 30, 38 minutes. 38 minutes, mm -hmm. um, which you wouldn't be able to do on TV. So suddenly you can find, you know, you can tell that story, which is a very simple linear story, and not have to worry about padding it out to get to your, you know, your standard mm. stock hour. Mm. And, and you don't have to write through. to ad breaks either, I guess. Yeah. No, although that is, that is a useful psychological trick when you're writing a script, is to imagine there are ad breaks, because mm. they're really helpful waypoints. Just apart from anything else, you think, oh, I can get to that bit, oh, fucking, fucking, fuck off for the day. Sorry yeah. for swearing. Um, <laughs> and, and also you think, I've got to build in a little uh, cliffhanger yep. there to keep peak, uh, to keep interest. Um, mm. I was going to say actually that um, a pl the, the, I think one of the reasons why we've been very fortunate on Netflix, being an anthology show, we don't have returning characters and we don't have cliffhangers basically, which makes it hard to keep an audience week to week if, you, if we were going out on network television. Mm -hmm. And also it makes it hard for us to promote episodes because as you saw earlier on when I didn't want to tell you anything about the new <laughs> season, we don't want to give anything away in our trails and things yep. like that. Because, because, of the, because it's all there in this sort of magic cupboard now, the magic telly cupboard in your house, mm -hmm. you can go there and you know you can, just, you can approach it in any order you like. That's sort of perfect for an anthology. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons why anthology shows seem to be having a resurgence of popularity. Anything that you've thought of that's too dark for Black Mirror that you haven't done? Uh, yeah, there was, a, there was a bit in San Junipero originally where... Mm. Um, Kelly, who's uh, Gugu's character, was going to be seen at a sort of creche, at a nursery, and then you realise later on these are all children who died, and like, and there's also there was, so, and that just seemed like such a harrowing element to the story. It overshadowed yeah. lots of other stuff. I think it's that it's not necessarily because it was too dark, but in that story it would have destabilised yeah. the whole. So I'd like to think nothing's too dark. <laughs> so do, the, do the team around ever have to sort of rein Charlie in a bit when some of his ideas go a little bit far down the rabbit hole? No, I would say... No, um, stand around encouraging me. Yeah, I would say we're all like-minded. Yeah. That, that, we sounded I'm really so, cagey yeah, then. I was like, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, it's... Um, it's uh, it's not, uh, we, and there's never any, there's never any pressure from Netflix or anything like that to sort of say, oh, you can't do that. Um, we've never had anything like that. We've been very fortunate, I think, generally, that throughout, mm. even on Channel 4, mm. I mean, when you saw our first episode, yep. God's sake, yeah. Um, yeah. that was a bit of a statement of intent. I would say this is making the show seem a lot bleaker than it is. I apologise. It's, ac it's actually quite entertaining. Yeah, I mean, there are moments of darkness and black comedy, but it's a, you know, they're all 
quite gripping stories. Yeah, I think we forget how depressing it is, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And are you aware of the... There's lots of humour in the show as well. Oh, yeah, well. there is. There's lots, yeah. yeah. But it's, you're I'm not writing very a defensive. comedy. Sorry? You're not writing a comedy. Sometimes they're overtly comedic. Yeah. Like, like, I would say USS Callister, which is the one with the sort of Star Trek VR theme going on in it, has moments of overt comedy. Nosedive has moments of overt comedy. Um, National Anthem, the very first one, has moments of overt comedy. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Pretty overt. Hang the DJ? This Hang the DJ a, was a rom-com. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's quite a lot. It's quite a lot. And you mentioned um, kind of wanting to piss people off by setting San Junipero in California, kind of in the, the hub of Silicon Valley and innovation and utopias mm -hmm. and visions and all these sort of things. Is there anywhere that you want to set a Black Mirror episode that you haven't yet? Uh, yes. Would that be giving anything away? Yes, it would. It would. I can't tell you that. <laughs> we'll I can't tell on. you that. We don't tend to. What we don't tend to do is like look at the news, say, yeah. and go, right, we've got to do an episode based on this. And quite often, actually, that's when, when people try and pitch us stories, and we try not to let people do that. Mm -hmm. But when people have tried to, they quite often go, oh, I've got an idea about like, the refugee crisis or something like that. And we're like, eh. Um, a, because I think our episodes tend to be not that specific yeah. about a, 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 a topic. And also, um, because I think in, in some ways our show is a bit more popcorn, is a bit more sort of Twilight Zone of a, a sort of hooky premise. And also we don't want to seem to be too preachy. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and also because at the moment, this slightly doubles back to what you were saying earlier on. You were asking about the world being in such a state, is it like... In, um, I was aware when we were doing season four, I was thinking while writing it, I don't know what state the world's going to be in by the time this goes out, and I don't know how much stomach there will be for mm. unrelenting dystopia. So we, there was a conscious decision to put a bit more humour in with mm. things like Hang the DJ and USS Callister, both of which probably turned out to be two of the most popular episodes that mm -hmm. season. Um, people need to smile. Well, I thought, I don't know if I want to sit there looking at people going, oh, no. Yeah. So you've, um, done, you've done 19 episodes of Black Mirror mm -hmm. so far. There's a few more in the can. We'll get in there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, only one's been directed by a woman. Um, obviously, they're all written by yourselves and a big team involved, of course. Mm -hmm. But are you worried sometimes that it's looking at the technological world, which is already hugely male-dominated, with an overly male lens? Oh, I don't... I don't know. Uh, as co-showrunner and, um, and a woman, and uh, a lot of our editors who cut the film, you know, the final film that everyone sees are women and production designers are women, and, you know, there's lots of women involved in making every single film. Um, so I don't worry that it feels through a male lens, and, um, I mean, it is, one of, it is one of my biggest frustrations that we are attempting to make a series of six films, um, six feature films, because they're all you know, some, some of them of that length and certainly of that scale and ambition, um, but on a TV schedule. So we often have six to eight weeks to get one of these films mm. um, made. And unfortunately, there are still far too few female directors out there, and the ones that are out there are booked months and years in advance. So we just don't, we ca just can't get anyone. That's the frustration. And hopefully that will change as more women come into the industry and as the industry changes to try and make it more hospitable for women. Hmm. Yeah. In terms of the scripts and the storylines, um, I don't really know. I mean, it's, it's tricky because I've tried, and there's been a deliberate attempt, like certainly like, for instance, the first, season one had all male protagonists, so I sort of thought, okay, for season two, I'm going to mix that up a bit. Episodes like San Junipero, I remember when I was writing that, I was very nervous that I was just getting this wrong, and I was getting mm. the voice of it wrong, and, and luckily, I don't, it seems I didn't, so... Um, uh, hopefully that can continue. Hmm. Final question. Um, what worries you most? Because you, you said that you're not technophobic. It's not a show that's just shitting on technology. Mm -hmm. You both like technology. Um, Charlie used to write about video games. You often talk about how not addicted to technology your children are, but how much they spend, how much time they spend playing video games and learning to code and all this sort of stuff. What worries you most about the technological addictions in your own lives or the lives of those that are closest to you? Um, I don't like the fact that, so I used to be a heavy smoker and the first thing I did every day was reach for a pack of cigarettes. <clears throat> I would wake up in the middle of the night to smoke. I would smoke in the shower, which takes 
dedication and skill. <laughs> Easier than you think. You just lean out with one hand, swap it now. Uh, and now I wake up, I don't smoke anymore, but I do wake up and I immediately reach for my phone without thinking and I'm slightly addicted to the sort of ceremony of swiping it about and click, like, like, and I can find myself slipping into a miniature coma hundreds of times a day. This afternoon, I start, and everyone must have done this at some point, I started looking for my phone while I was holding it. <laughs> which, you know, while I was looking at it, I thought, where's my phone? Um, and started, you know, that panic you get, that's like worry you get that you don't know where it is. And that reminded me of, I was such a heavy smoker that I used to light a cigarette and then put it down for a second and light another one. And it was exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, I think that's and, dementia. <laughs> it probably is. Oh, God, I shouldn't say that to you. Yeah, yeah, fucking you hell, shouldn't say that to me. A week of work um, lost. <laughs> Um, so it's probably, I don't, and that's, that's quite a basic thing, is just the, the physical, the, I, I think just the, 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 the physical sort of little ceremony of it is, mm. is in itself addicting. It must be feeding something in my head and it feels like the same thing that was feeding my uh, cigarette addiction. And even though you're aware of it, you can't stop it. I've done the things that people do where you get like, you know, download like Moment or something like that. Or I know someone who writes novels who locks his phone in a little kitchen safe thing with a timer on it. You know, I've tried all of those things, but it's like water. It's like it, 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 I tried using that thing freedom to cut off the internet mm -hmm. access to my computer while I typed and I just started using my phone. <laughs> so it's just like water that goes round a rock, you know. Um, yep. So, yeah, you can't. I did all the things, you know, making the screen monochrome, so it's less interesting to look at. But I just changed it back because it was yeah. boring to look at. <laughs> um, so, Annabelle, for you? Uh, uh, I probably worry that I don't have enough time to have an addiction. Mm. I think that's doing an anthology show. Is I, that have, I have a FOMO <laughs> of not using social media enough. A FOMO? Well, a FOMO. What am I saying? I don't, I don't have time to have an addiction, and that's the concern. Maybe you're addicted to... You're to addicted. Not. Well, no, you must be addicted to all of that. Yeah, OK. Mm. Yeah, that. mm. that's the answer. Whereas you're addicted to... That. The beast. <laughs> Just that. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I do lose track of time. I'm not, like, aware of time passing, and it does feel like I, my brain snaps out of it, and then I sort of have to snap back into reality quite a lot. Which I'm sure is not a, which is the, which is meant to be the state you get in when you're writing, and you're you're not aware of your own physicality and time passing and this that and the other. And instead of I'm wasting it on looking up just articles I don't really need to know. I was reading about a Wings album from 1976 the other day. Got no interest in hearing it, but I was reading the entire fucking history of the recording of every track for no fucking reason other than it was better than dealing with whatever little slice of reality I was stuck in at that fucking moment. Well. We will end this slice of reality here. <laughs> <laughs> and you can move on to the next one. Charlie and Annabelle, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.